Welcome to EPG Patshala. This paper is the philosophy of law. The name of this module is the introduction to the philosophy of law. The objectives of this module are to introduce the philosophy of law as a discipline and to foreground the 40 modules that appear in this paper. I'm Akash Singh Rator from the Lewis University of Rome and I've written this module. When we talk about philosophy of law, there are many other names that we can use to describe this field. We can call it legal philosophy, of course, but also legal theory, and it's commonly known as jurisprudence. Why does it have so many names? The argument that we take in this paper is that these names are external to the content or the material that is studied in the philosophy of law or legal theory or jurisprudence. In other words, philosophy of law is called philosophy of law if it's taught in philosophy departments. It's called legal theory or the history of legal theory if it's taught in history departments or political science departments. And most standardly in law schools, it's known as jurisprudence. But the content of all of these uh, uh, courses remains more or less the same. There might be slight divergences, but those divergences can be uh, 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 more or less understood to be unique influences of the discipline in which the course is offered rather than inherent to the discipline itself. In this respect, you'll be familiar to uh, uh, titling uh, the same content in different ways like ontology or metaphysics or aesthetics or the philosophy of art or um, uh, moral philosophy or ethical theory and so on. Uh, there's not really that much difference uh, except in the, the nature of the languages or the traditions that have produced the material in question. The content remains more or less the same. So what are we asking in these disciplines? The philosophy of law or jurisprudence asks fundamentally foundational questions. In other words, it asks a question such as, what is the nature of the law? What is the law for? Now this is a foundational question, which is very different from asking a positive question. For example, what does the law say about the crime of murder? In order to answer a question that I call the positive question, all you need to do is look up the answer in a code book, in a, a procedural book or a, a, a criminal code book or something like that, you can find your answer. But foundational questions aren't answered in any such book. Foundational questions have to be discussed, debated, deliberated upon. And something crucial about the nature of foundational questions is that they have a tendency to change over time. So in speaking about foundational questions, what we, all should, what we should also realize in the philosophy of law is that the foundational questions of the philosophy of law are analogous to those same kinds of foundational questions you ask yourself in other disciplines. For example, in ethics, why should I be moral? What is the nature of the good life? Or in political philosophy, who should rule? These kinds of questions are strictly analogous to the kinds of questions you ask in the philosophy of law, such as what is the nature of law and why should I follow it? Now, when we're talking about the nature of law, we're asking this, we're posing this question as universal or absolute. In other words, what is the nature of law as such? not what do I think is the nature of law or what does uh, uh, some uh, particular jurist say is the nature of law and how that changes. In other words, we've, we're, we're touching on a universal element. But in this paper, we're treating not just the philosophy of law in some abstract sense. We're treating it quite historically and geographically contextualized. In other words, we're talking always about the philosophy of law in India, or you can say Indian philosophy of law. So you can see here a kind of tension between the universal aspect of a foundational question that the, the answer to which has a tendency to be uh, more or less identical across different geographies and different times, and the specification of both place and time by orienting ourselves towards Indian philosophy of law in particular. Now, how do we explain this difference? Well, when we're talking about law, we're talking about man-made law. We're talking about law made by human beings for the regulation of human behaviors. These sorts of laws, very different from natural laws, which are true 
in all places and all times. These kinds of laws are, of course, uh, alterable by the nature of the conditions. Now, we don't say gravity is any different in the UK or in India, but the nature of the law is, of course, very different because the nature of the community is different and the circumstances are different. So this is how we deal with both that universal aspect about the foundational questions about the nature of law and the specificities about what do we mean by law in India, what is it meant to do, what is it meant to achieve. So keep in mind that throughout this paper, we are not simply engaged with some totally abstract philosophy of law, but rather one that is concretely grounded in Indian circumstances and contexts. Now, Philosophy of law is actually very rarely taught in India. It's normally taught as jurisprudence in law schools, but to my uh, uh, knowledge, I know of only one routinely taught philosophy of law course throughout uh, uh, all of the central and state universities of India. The jurisprudence courses that are taught in law schools are mandatory and uh, 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 taught at uh, every law school systematically. And there's a standard model by which uh, it's taught. The standard model generally consists of four units. The first unit speaks on introductory topics like the definition, nature, and scope of jurisprudence. Something like what I'm doing in this uh, presentation now. What is the scope of the philosophy of law and what do we mean by it? And then it moves quite, quite immediately into certain historical developments of the conception of law. For example, natural law comes first, its development and its relevance in modern times. And then the analytic school of law, which consists mostly, according to the standard model of jurisprudence, of discussions about Austin's theory of law, Hans Kelsen's pure theory of law, and HLA Hart's concept of law. Then the lawyers in India move on in this standard jurisprudence course to the second unit, which treats of thematic presentations of jurisprudence. So the historical school, the realist school, and the sociological school. Immediately after that, students studying jurisprudence in India generally move on to topics like the administration of justice, socioeconomic approach, and philosophy law and social change, legal aid, and public interest litig litigation. And then finally comes the fourth unit. So finally comes the fourth unit on the sources and elements of law. That is, the sources of law, custom precedent legislation, the distinction between rights and duties, possession and ownership, and what is the meaning of persons. Now, I've gone through this standard model, not because it's the model we follow, but precisely because it's the model that we seek not to follow. In this paper on the philosophy of law, we are going to undertake several kinds of innovations in the treatment of philosophy of law that differs radically from the way that jurisprudence is taught at every law school in India. I'm going to explain a little bit why this is so and how this is so. So the reason that we want to, to teach the philosophy of law differently from the way that jurisprudence is taught is because Anyone who's very sensitive to the nature of law manifest, manifesting itself in India is aware of something that we refer to as multiform hybridity. The nature of the legal system in India is characterized by this multiform hybridity. What do I mean by this? By hybrid, hybrid has a standard meaning, a mix, a blend, so most conspicuously a blend of foreign and indigenous elements. But at the same time, a blend of ancient and modern elements. So there are a number of ways that you can be hybrid. You can mix local and customary practices with universal, in other words, the law of the state, which is you know, imposed on everybody universally, every citizen universally. And uh, you can mix national law, so law produced in India by legislators with international law. Uh, customary practices within um, and between nations. So I've mentioned many different uh, levels of uh, law, 
uh, and many different locations or sources of law, foreign, indigenous, by indigenous you can mean modern, you can mean ancient, by modern you can mean local practices or state law, and then uh, you can also refer to the difference between international law and national. But this is what we mean by hybridity. We're, law in India is a confluence and a mixture of all of these uh, kinds of um, divergent sources and uh, influences. Now you take that hybridity and you add another layer up, uh, onto it, which we refer to as multi-form. In other words, uh, a hybridity of various kinds of forms. And what this introduces into the, the static idea of hybridity, in other words, that um, uh, different places are informing the practice of law or different uh, periods are informing the process of law, is the dynamic late nature of law and legal interpretation itself. So, in other words, uh, what the law is, is constantly changing. So every day a new decision is made by a judge that impacts the, what we understand by the nature of law. Every day parliament or uh, state legislators pass new laws. So when you undertake something like the philosophy of law, what you're doing is you're taking a static picture, a photograph of something that's actually dynamically in action. So this multiform process is the motion of all of the hybridities that I spoke of through time. It's a mixture of the fact that what I had earlier referred to as foreign over time is more or less identical to indigenous. Just think of something like the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was a, 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 a British institutional imposition that since 1947 uh, uh, has uh, uh, become uh, dear to every lawyer and, and, and most uh, common citizens as something authentically Indian and something to which we can um, relate as uh, legitimately legal. Now, the multiform hybridity then is the idea of the way that what was originally foreign might become an indigenous or indigenized and what was originally indigenous might become uh, outdated, outmoded, and, um, or reinterpreted. So this is a very co uh, complex idea of multiform hybridity, but if you don't understand multiform hybridity, you cannot actually understand the nature of law, not only in India, but in any society uh, at all. Now, maybe it would be helpful if I give you an example of this multiform hybridity in action. The perfect example is the Indian Constitution. The Indian Constitution, as I had mentioned, deals with institutions like the Supreme Court, Parliament, that were uh, originally foreign elements that were imposed by uh, the British, and it also mixes certain indigenous practices. We have uh, the uh, uh, panchayats appearing within uh, the Constitution. We have uh, a discussion of duties that originate in a very Gandhian, uh, unique uh, Gandhian uh, uh, philosophy. So we have a number of these elements that, um, when it appeared uh, in the 40s, was a, uh, something like a, a, uh, a foreign object. I mean, it, it wasn't really uh, part of the organic Indian body politic. But look at it now, 50, 60 years later, you see that the Indian Constitution is not only organically uh, a part of the Indian bod body politic, but it even constitutes, it forms further developments of the nature of that body politic. Each of us, our identities as Indians, is constituted by what was in the 40s seen as something alien, something hybrid. And this is multiform hybridity in action the assimilation of foreign elements, the indigenizing of uh, uh, ancient and modern and all of these processes going through uh, over a period of time. Now, with this multiform hybridity idea in mind and with the, the standard picture of jurisprudence that is taught in law schools throughout India, I want you to see how this paper, the 40 modules in the philosophy of law, um, 
incorporates multiform hybridity to correct certain deficiencies in the standard model. The modules in this paper, uh, the philosophy of law, are grouped into more or less three broad domains. The first domain, uh, which includes the first about 15 uh, modules or so, are devoted to the philosophy of law as it is taught and understood more or less around the world. And the reason that it's taught in a more or less similar way around the world is precisely because of the dominance and influence of Anglo-American jurisprudence. In other words, the institutions that India inherited from the British were also inherited by 40 other Commonwealth countries and uh, implemented in the United States, implemented in Canada, implemented in Australia, and all sorts of other uh, uh, legal systems that dominate the intellectual horizon of jurisprudence or the philosophy of law. So in other words, the first set of modules that will appear in an Indian philosophy of law paper will naturally recapitulate the very sorts of modules that are taught in any philosophy of law course more or less anywhere around the world. And we see that in the standard model in unit one and unit two. But what is special about the Indian philosophy of law paper, or the way that we are trying to reinterpret the philosophy of law as being more relevant to the Indian context, is the second bunch of, paper, of modules, the second uh, domain. So we were discussing the way in which the philosophy of law paper differs from the standard model jurisprudence. And the second broad theme uh, doesn't appear, if you look back in the standard model, it doesn't appear as any one of the four units that are taught in the standard uh, picture of jurisprudence or the philosophy of law in India. So this paper is quite innovative in the sense that it introduces elements that are uh, uh, more concerned with the basic contextuality or contextualization of law and it reinterprets the uh, mainstream philosophy of law, which I had mentioned is the sort of philosophy of law that's taught universally around the world. It reinterprets those themes and ideas in accordance with the uh, context, the ground realities in India. And this can be a, a very useful way in sifting what is uh, required for us to know, what is required for philosophers in India to think about, what is required for lawyers to think about when they study jurisprudence. To just to take a small example, obviously from unit uh, one and two in the standard model, we study um, uh, sociological schools of law. Well, this is uh, deeply relevant because India has had a number of uh, of uh, jurists or legal theorists and legal practitioners who have attempted to reinterpret Indian law from a perspective that favors uh, the common man. So uh, the rise of public interest litigation, for example, comes out of this sociological concern within jurisprudence in India. But on the other hand, we have teachings like Kelsen's pure theory of law. Now, Kelsen's uh, theory of law derived out of a, a need inherent to continental jurisprudence to try to accommodate Austinian or British models of law with the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. So the kinds of critiques uh, of pure reason and purity that Kant sought for in his uh, philosophy, critical philosophy overall, was to be emulated by philosophers and legal philosophers in Europe. And so Kelsen comes up with a pure theory of law that manages to um, uh, satisfy the Kantian conception of how reason, reason should work. Now, as interesting as that is for somebody like me, a philosopher of law, the fact is it's totally irrelevant to what we uh, need to know when we ask ourselves in India, why should I follow the law? What is the nature of the law? What, um, what is uh, the uh, uh, force of law and so on? Kelsen's pure theory of law, for example, is an internal discussion about internal issues to a particular era in continental Europe. And it adds very little value to our education in India uh, 
uh, when we're thinking about the nature of law. So why is it? Uh, why does? Why do we continue to teach Kelsen's theory of law as opposed to say any of the elements or modules that you will find in the second broad division of this paper, such as Gandhi's theory of law uh, or Ambedkar's theory of law? I think it should be clear to anybody that in our context in the 21st century in India, there if there's only so much space in the syllabus, that space should be devoted to Gandhi or Ambedkar's theory of law rather than some uh, uh, attempt of a continental European to Kantianize his, uh, his own thought. Now, the third domain, the third broad domain, are uh, more uh, uh, like concrete case studies. So in other words, we are going to take the ideas from the first domain, theory of law as such, and the second domain, the Indian context of law, legal practices, and, and legal theory. And we are going to see what sort of results we find when treating specific cases that um, are of, uh, of concern in India. Ones that readily pop to mind are, of course, the, um, the uh, uh, problem we have with uh, rape, uh, in, in India now, and so what kind of laws do we have in, in um, governing uh, 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 rape trials? What is their origin? Do they originate from, uh, for example, Macaulay's law, law code, or do they originate from certain uh, Hindu customary practices and so on? So this, this way of uh, disentangling a contemporary phenomenon like the um, the uh, widely publicized uh, problems related to rape cases in India is treated in the third division in relation to the theory of law from the first and the context of law from the second. Now what these uh, uh, modules do in the third broad division, these are from around module 25 to 40, is that they give you a number of ways to understand the relevance of the theory of law. So theory of law is not just for legal theorists. Theory of law is um, there so that practitioners of law, whether uh, judges or legislators, can be guided in some respect on the, the meaning and consequences of law that they've made in the past, the way that that law that they have made in the past might have been regarded as um, as uh, unconstitutional, it might have been regarded as violating certain traditions of law that we recognize as valuable, for example, natural justice or uh, natural law, or violating principles of um, social concern in law and so on. So uh, legislators are not uh, always up to speed on the consequences of the law that they uh, need to enact. They're responding to a specific problem. The clearest case in this uh, is, uh, of course, something like POTA or uh, uh, prevention of terrorism. Uh, legislators have a clear problem that faces uh, all of us, which is our security, and so they need to step in and make certain laws or legislative acts uh, right away. What they don't think about in the process of addressing the issue is all of the consequences that uh, derive from it. Is a law that is attempting to prevent or deal with our security or terrorism, is it violating certain fundamental rights that we uh, hold dear? For example, in the attempt to regulate or prevent terrorism, are we preventing free speech? Are we preventing freedom of movement? In other words, are we producing laws that violate the principles behind other laws that we produce? Lawmakers can't do this work for themselves. This is the job of philosophers of law, legal theorists, and other uh, jurists who study jurisprudence. And what we find in the third section of uh, the paper, those modules from roughly 25 to the end, are uh, a great deal of case studies that can inform a much wider public about the ramifications of taking certain legislative uh, decisions. Now, what I've been trying to argue uh, in this introductory module is that when we're dealing with the philosophy of law, we have to remain sensitive to context. And this is nowhere more true than 
India because in India, as I had mentioned, on the one hand, philosophy of law is very rarely taught. Um, and on the other hand, where it is taught universally, which is law schools, it's taught as a jurisprudence that's completely insensitive to the local context. So we need to find some space in between. What this paper has attempted to do is to take steps towards carving out that in-between in space. And we've done this in 10 to 15 modules um, in the uh, middle of the paper. But what I hope to, to, to achieve uh, as you finish this entire uh, paper on the philosophy of law is to educate a new group of uh, interested students in taking forward uh, the pursuit of the philosophy of law as a peculiarly Indian enterprise. Because eventually philosophy of law will start to be more widely taught in universities and uh, in social science programs uh, and not just in law schools. And when it is, do we want it taught according to the standard model? Not at all. We want it taught according to a model that is far more um, useful for not only philosophers, uh, but for uh, the wider public uh, legislators, judges, lawmakers, uh, the wider public at large. So to achieve this is to achieve a certain kind of authenticity in the philosophy of law. Now what do I mean by this term authenticity? Well, interestingly, some uh, uh, well-known judges uh, like uh, Krishna Iyer have suggested that in their Supreme Court jurisprudence, in other words, as a Supreme Court judge, the decisions that they lay out is starting to be more and more oriented towards authentic decision making. By authentic, they mean that the decisions that they make have to be more oriented not towards the original, for example, British codes that generated the, the logic behind that law, but rather the need to apply that formula to the actual grassroots uh, uh, conditions or to the conditions of the uh, Indian common man. So as Krishna Iyer has argued, uh, uh, for philosophy of law to be authentic in India, then its uh, motivation needs to follow that humane and egalitarian practice that guides uh, uh, legal practitioners and legal theorists in India. It needs to be consistent with the way that jurisprudence in India is actually evolving and liberate itself from the way that it was expected to evolve under British rule. Now, at the same time, this doesn't mean that we are going to cultivate a completely indigenous legal system. We're never going to abolish uh, uh, institutions like uh, Parliament or, or uh, the Supreme Court or other kinds of institutions that were um, originally alien. As I had mentioned much before, multiform hybridity shows us that the alien can be integrated and become as authentic as anything indigenous. But the key about this is to recognize what are called best practices. So we don't pick and choose because of the origin of where some uh, idea or institution arises. We pick and choose because it is the best uh, it produces the uh, best practices or the best consequences when we have to deal with the um, uh, regulation or lawmaking or um, judging whether uh, the laws that have been made are uh, uh, fair and, um, and adequate. So you can uh, use at a local level a, a community of, uh, of elders, but we know that uh, that community of elders has largely been inflected by caste or class or gender interests. But we also have um, uh, instances of uh, best practices at the uh, uh, village level. So when we find the best practices, then why not adopt them? Because that's what uh, people actually use at the grassroots level. So if we are going to be making law for villagers, then why not adopt the best practices that villagers have been employing for making law for themselves? Now, that kind of uh, indigenous orientation cannot be used to attempt to uh, filter out uh, other practices merely because they're foreign. In fact, the nature of law 
in the world today, as I had mentioned, is multiform. So India can produce all the law it wants, but it is still subject to the, um, uh, to the uh, structure of international norms and international law. So even if we should decide that uh, uh, we will, uh, just to take a crazy example, uh, murder foreigners from X uh, country who come to our shore, even if that's passed as a law of parliament and not overturned by the Supreme Court, nevertheless, international law prohibits it and it does not stand as um, valid law, whether we will it to be or not. So in, in sum, what I'm trying to suggest is that the authenticity in Indian law is to be found by incorporating the best practices of the uh, processes of um, self-governance. Uh, uh, At the same time, in a globalized world, we have to stay attuned to the fact that self-governance isn't all that matters. There are in international institutions to which India is a state party creating law for India to which every Indian citizen is bound. And then in between, even the practices that we have that may have been uh, foreign originally are very much Indian now. In order to understand the philosophy of law, you need to understand all of these different levels, these different hybridities as I had spoken of, and you need to approach it in a diachronic or a, what we refer to as a multi-form way, a way that's evolving and changing over time. And that's what we hope you will learn from the philosophy of law paper. Thank you.